from an early prediction to a near nuclear holocaust. Stay tuned to number one to find out how the Cuban Missile Crisis almost happened twice. Number 10. Eisenhower sort of predicted it. President Eisenhower had a great wealth of war experience, having served in the military along with political knowledge as President of the United States. By the 1960s, Kennedy was in the White House and he had to deal with the continuing Cold War between the US and Soviet Union. Even worse, the US neighbor to the south, Cuba, had recently turned communist. With the rise of Fidel Castro and the communist Cuba, the US helped a group of exiled Cubans to try to retake the country in the Bay of Pigs invasion. This failed horribly, in just three days, in part due to indecisive action from Kennedy. After this, Kennedy asked Eisenhower for advice in dealing with Cuba and the Soviets. Eisenhower questioned why Kennedy didn't do more for the invasion, and he said he didn't want to escalate things to a worse degree. Eisenhower, though, replied that the lack of action showed the Soviets that the US can be pushovers and they will now certainly provoke us even more. Within two years, the Cuban Missile Crisis would strike, proving Eisenhower right. The Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962 was a tense 13 days for the United States. Soviet troops were bringing nuclear warheads to Cuba, a country that was close enough to launch the bombs and hit nearly any target in the States. Needless to say, this worried a lot of people. Number 9. Kennedy Caught a Cold Okay, not really. But when the crisis began, Kennedy was busy like any other president would be. Speeches to give, people to meet, and upcoming midterm elections had him out on the road all over the country. Obviously, he had to get back to DC as soon as possible, but with many prior commitments, it would raise suspicion to cancel them all without notice. In hopes of not scaring the entire nation, Kennedy's staff told the press that he had caught a cold and had a fever and must return to DC. This way, no one would be suspicious of anything going on. Kennedy was able to return to the White House and begin handling the situation while the White House staff could figure out how to break the news to the nation. Vice President Johnson did the same thing, reporting an illness and cutting a trip short to return to DC. Number 8. A Soviet Helped the US not everyone on the commie side was happy to see their decisions. A man named Colonel Oleg Penkovsky wasn't in favor of what his leaders were doing, so he took matters into his own hands. With access to the manuals and other missile system information, he secretly got the information into the hands of the CIA. This information turned out to be incredibly important. Between the manuals, the documents, and aerial photographs taken by the US government, the White House was able to analyze the situation and help end the crisis much faster than they would have otherwise. Unfortunately for Penkovsky, though, no one really knows what happened afterwards. As he was arrested by his own people, it was assumed that he was caught by his Soviet commanders and executed for treason. Number 7. Kennedy Created XCOM when the Cuban Missile Crisis struck, the US really didn't have a dedicated team of military experts available to consult on such a situation. Until then, the president usually consulted a few trusted cabinet members or lead military officials and made decisions on his own. For such a unique situation, something else had to be done. Kennedy immediately created the Executive Committee of the National Security Council. This team came together to discuss the many options available for dealing with the situation. The options they considered included a full-scale attack on Cuba, a strike on the bases which had nuclear weapons, and a blockade to stop more bombs from coming in. And after two days, the blockade was chosen as the best option. Years later, declassified tapes of their historic meetings have been made available to the public. Number 6. Ready for War The US already had some animosity towards Cuba. They had recently helped Fidel Castro take power over the oppressive government that was in charge, only to see him become communist. They attacked the Bay of Pigs with a team of Cuban exiles to win back the country, but it had failed within days. So, all things considered, the US didn't need much more reason to wage war. When the missile crisis began, the US was already very much considering war, 
On October 24, 1962, with the U.S. blockade in place, more Soviet ships threatened to go through and deliver more nukes to the island. As they showed no signs of backing down, the U.S. was ready, with plans to attack certain areas of Cuba and preparations for nuclear strikes on the Soviet Union if they were to retaliate. Fortunately, things cooled off over the next few days and all nations came to an agreement to end the crisis. However, the U.S. had many plans ready to roll if they were necessary. Number 5. False Alarm Triggered by a Bear Folkfield Air Base had a scare just days after learning of the Cuban Missile Crisis. The base's alarm system set to go off in the event of an imminent attack had been triggered. According to their tools, the Soviets were in flight to the U.S. and bombs were ready to drop. With this knowledge, the base equipped their planes with air-to-air -air missiles preparing to shoot down any bombs the Soviet Union may try to drop. As the planes lined up to take off, everything was canceled. The leaders explained that it was a false alarm. As it turns out, a bear had climbed over a fence and damaged the alarm system for the military bases. Other bases received a sabotage alarm, while Volkfield received an imminent attack alarm. Fortunately, it was all figured out right before takeoff of a single plane. Number 4. One Soviet Helped Evade Nuclear War The Cuban Missile Crisis came very close to launching World War III and leading to tons of the world's destruction. On October 27, 1962, a Navy ship spotted a Soviet submarine off the coast of Cuba. To force them to surface, the Navy dropped warning shots into the water. Below the surface, the Soviet fighters did not know how to react. Were these warning shots or had war broken out? If the latter, it would be a good time for them to launch their nuclear torpedo, the one that the Navy had no idea they were even provoking. Three commanders on board had to unanimously decide to fire the nuke, but one man did not, insisting that they call Moscow for more information. When they did, they were told to stand down. Vasily Arkhipov of the Soviet Armed Forces chose not to launch a nuke that could have led to world destruction. Interestingly, this was not the only time the east coast of the US was almost nuked. Check out our video on near-death experiences to see how many times the US was in fact threatened. Number 3. The United States won, kinda. From October 26th through the 28th, Kennedy and Soviet leader Khrushchev began talking. After two days of intense conversation, the two sides had come to an agreement to end the crisis and ease everyone's fears. Publicly, the agreement was this. The Soviets take back their nuclear weapons from Cuba, and the United States agrees not to attack Cuba without being provoked. On the surface, this sounded like a big win for the US. The bombs were gone, and war was evaded. However, the US didn't tell the full story. As it turns out, the United States also agreed to remove nuclear weapons from military bases in Italy and Turkey, bases that were close enough for an attack on the Soviet Union. This agreement, looking like a loss for the US, wasn't made public for many years. Number 2. Not all the nukes were removed from Cuba When the crisis had ended, the Soviets agreed to remove all of their nuclear warheads from the island of Cuba. However, it turns out that they didn't. Instead, they took back their long-range and mid-range missiles, but not the short-range tactical ones. The plan was to leave them behind for the Cubans in the event that they were needed for their own security. The Soviets were set to train the locals on how to use them as long as they didn't reveal their presence on the island. Despite all of this, even the Soviets were worried about the stability of Castro and his likelihood of using the bombs for no good reason. In December of 1962, these fears led the Soviets to change their minds and take all of the nukes back home. Interestingly enough, all of this happened without America's knowledge until files were discovered decades later. Before we get to number one, you know we have to ask you to take a moment to like this video and subscribe to Zero to Hero. I mean, why wouldn't you? Number one, it almost happened again. Eight years after the first crisis, U.S. planes flew over Cuba and discovered new military bases. This worried them, so they reported to their superiors. After some investigation, it was confirmed that Soviet forces were building new weapons on new bases in Cuba. Part of the confirmation of this situation was the sudden appearance of soccer fields. And, as Henry Kissinger said, Cubans play baseball, Russians play soccer. Even worse, the Soviet Union confirmed it. 
stating it technically did not infringe on the agreement made in 1962 after the Cuban Missile Crisis. The US told the Soviets to stand down, but they refused. After a few back and forth meetings, the US demanded that the Soviets back off, and fortunately they did. Construction of the bases slowly came to a halt, and the Soviet presence left the island for a second time. Crisis averted. How do you think the world would be different if the Russians had been successful in creating these military bases? Let us know in the comments below, and take care.